So we're gonna go in here, Squire Rum and Barrel House. And hopefully have a little tour, tasting. We don't really know what we're gonna have, but uh, let's go. Me, I'm a fanatic about Scotch and Irish whiskeys. I am a fanatic about Scotch and Irish Yeah, so key fans tend to be my favorites because they appreciate the production style of the rum, you'll see. Um, but uh, I never really paid that much attention to uh, you know, rum at the time, which is unfortunate because he started showing me all these different rums, four square, things like that, that had just such a richness of character. And up until that point, I really only assumed that rum was kind of like a thin white rum, you know, meant for pina coladas and mojitos. And I didn't realize that if you made it in this, you know, in a different style, that you could make rum that was just as rich, if not richer than, you know, your, your whiskeys, things like that. And that's what we've done. So we've taken my experience in, in making whiskeys, right? Uh, Irish and Scotch whiskeys, uh, Scotch whiskey barrel aging, things like that, things that I studied, um, and we applied them to rum. The biggest difference between the two, people say, well, what's the difference really between, you know, whiskeys and rum, is that there's uh, the, the base ingredient is sugar cane molasses versus you know any kind of grain, which would be whiskey. In the case of Irish or Scotch whiskeys, it's malted barley, or barley, malted barley primarily. Um, but with the, uh, the sugar cane, you know, the, the, the molasses, one of the things that really changes the, the perception of rum is that they use what's called a column still. The column still is a vodka style still, right? And what it does is it brings the alcohol to about 98% alcohol, uh, 96 to 98%, and then it'll, it'll bring it right back down, water it back down to 35 to 40%. So what you have is mostly water. And that's why it mixes so well into things like, you know, pina coladas and mojitos. Very neutral sort of spirit. Doesn't really interfere with uh, the fruit juice and things like that that's going on. On the other end, though, if you're talking about whiskeys, right, Irish whiskey, Scotch whiskey, what you'll have is you'll distill it to about, for us, in our case, it's 64% alcohol, right? That leaves a whole lot more character, you know, on the other side, right? And that's where the flavor comes from. So what we're going to do today is we're going to go into the barrel room. We're going to try some overproof rum. And then we'll come back here and talk about how it's produced and all that sort of thing. Okay, you ready? What I want to start with is a little bit of a, of a batch two blend. And then we're going to taste batch three, which I'm really excited about. So I'm excited about that example uh, showing off, you know, kind of what we're working on in work here. But start with batch two. I want to give you guys a heads up. Most rums are between 70 and 80 proof. Uh, what we're trying here is 92 proof. So it's quite a bit stronger. And if you think that's powerful, what we're going to be trying is 120 proof, 122 proof. So, even stronger than that. This is just on the verge of being an overproof, but consider it overproof for us. Uh, so, got a bit of a picture with the alcohol. But at the same time, uh, hopefully it has a lot of character that puts it forward as well. Is anyone getting anything that really jumps out at them in terms of flavor? Is anyone getting kind of a note of like a caramel or a butterscotch, uh, creme brulee? Yeah. Sugar. Yeah. All those sort of characters, especially as the glass gets empty, you can sit and smell it out. Like, uh, if, you finish, if you finish your smell glass, you might get this like richer, syrupy sort of thing. A little trick for smelling whiskeys and things like that is when you take the glass, if it's a pot still spirit, that means it's going to have an oily composition. Uh, whereas a pot uh, still spirit will have, you know, like a, a rubbing alcohol, just kind of evaporates out, right? That's what happens when you use the column distilled spirit because it makes alcohol so strong. But if you use the pot distilled spirit, uh, what you're going to have is a little bit more of a rich oiliness. That's where the molecule comes from. That's why it feels a little bit chewier in the mouth, right? So, what you're going to have here then with a pot distilled spirit, that oil will linger and it'll keep a lot of the scent intact. So, when you smell it, you might be able to get the notes after you've finished, right? And that's a good way to taste, right? You get the caramel. Creme brulee kind of character, brown sugars, like burnt brown sugars, almost like a toasted caramel. Um, and maybe some of that vanilla is still coming through. Some of the oakiness certainly comes through. And that's one of the beautiful things about a pop still spirit is they evolve in the glass over time. So, so if you swirl them around, you get more and more scent. That's what goes. Um, but anyways, so that all is coming naturally. The vanilla, for example, that's coming from a compound in the wood called vanilla. It occurs naturally in uh, especially French oak here, right? French American oak, you'll have this 
richness of compound culture. Which is the same compound that's available in vanilla beans, right? That the, the brain recognizes as a smell vanilla. So when somebody adds vanilla flavor into a rum or any sort of spirit, it's in the effort to replicate the aging. Because that does occur naturally over the course of aging if you're aging in an oak barrel. Um, other than that, all the other ones, the, uh, the caramel, the creme brulee, the, uh, the butterscotch character, that's coming from the distillation itself. So that's raw in the distillation. If we had used the column spill, it would strip all of that right out. Right? So, anyhow, so we've got some more that I want to try. Let's try a little bit from each one of these barrels. So how long did you do this uh, uh, in the barrel for? Six years in total. Okay. Right? Well, so why? Six years in total. So that's six years because it's like, you need like target six years or why did you do six so, years? The funniest thing was is we were aiming for five years. Uh, it just we happened to open during COVID. You know, so that put up all of our plans back yeah. you know, the whole year. Yeah. Um, so it ended up becoming a six year run instead of a five year run. <laughs> and what we noticed is the difference in quality between the two was immense. Really? So we decided to stick with the six years instead of you know trying to push more run out in five years. Um, and it's been a good it's been a really good That's development awesome. for us. Um, De definitely. It's completely changed the, the whole character of the realm. It's something I'm really proud of actually is that sixth year. So and that's a long time for realm because if you think about the laws that you know revolve around let's say Puerto Rico, for example. To be Puerto Rican rum, you only have to age for one year. And that's where most sit, is right around one or two years, right? Um, so six years ends up being a long time, especially here in the heat of the Caribbean where things age quicker. So we'll talk about that a little bit when we get out of the heat. So that's just you might notice this is a pretty warm room, right? So all right, so I'm going to fill up with these, this second. I'm going to fill us up a little bit here. So did you choose the wood to the barrel? Yes, actually, that's one of my favorite parts of my job. That's pretty awesome. So the, the coolest part of my job, I think, is, is I get to go out to Portugal and I get to go out to Spain, that's where these two barrels are coming from. They were held by wine producers for us. So these are port barrels. So as you smell them, what you might get is a little bit more of that vanilla, and you might get some cherry on the very top. That's coming from the scent of the, the wine that they used to hold. Um, so it's not that there's any wine that's still in here, but the aroma of the wine persisted you know, when they shipped it on over to us. So they, right? Soft and brown. This is why I'm really excited about uh, you know, batch three, because even though it's stronger, it tastes more rounded, more softer, smoother, doesn't it? And the reason for that is because each time that we went out to go select barrels, people would, right? Softer, right? So every time we'd go out to select barrels, they would kind of just give us, not a cold shoulder, but they would give us what they have. Um, this time now that we're talking, we talked about getting 12 barrels instead of one or two. Instead of one or two, they, uh, they kind of allowed us a better selection. Uh, all 12 of them are the same producer, but none of the barrels are exactly the same. Um, you can almost think of it like painting, right? When you're painting, uh, a picture. You don't want to use just one red. You kind of want to use multiple hues of red. And so that's what we have here. Is even though they're all fundamentally the same kind of character, uh, they're all going to be slightly different. And that's how we make our blends. And so my job, tough life that I lead, I have to go and taste each one of these barrels, you know, at least once a week. Right? So I go through a wall. So that when the time comes to blend them, uh, I know exactly what we're dealing with, where they were, how they developed, and what the differences between the two are. Um, so we make that final blend between that. So we can be fully aware of the painting that you know, as it were. That's awesome. It's one of the fascinating things when you think about the distillation of the uh, well, that's a very scientific process. For people, once you, once you have the recipe, you can distill over and over and over. So this one, it's like I was saying, this one's about 120 proof. Uh, which I think is really cool that, like you were saying, like you mentioned, that it's soft and rounded. That means that now that I've had my chance to really select the girls, apparently I'm doing something right. Yeah. Because I've gotten that, you know, was that a consensus that this one tastes soft and yeah, rounded? Yeah, definitely. Right? So now that I can finally choose my own barrels, apparently we're choosing them right. So, so it's exciting. So. And then we'll try this one. This one's, this one's getting close to being ready. These ones have about four more months on them until they're ready to be bottled. Uh, these ones right here, though, they're close to eight months. So this one's younger, and you'll see the difference in color as I fill it the glass. You guys remember the color of the, uh, of the glass in the last one? So it's not a huge difference, but you can see there's a difference in color. You know, it's not as rich, it's kind of like those red dark hues. Uh, it's a little bit more amber in color. You know? And that's got to do with the barrel here. They're younger. It's not going to be as soft as, in, as the last one, but I think you'll notice that the palette is, is really rounded. 
Uh, some people say it's sweeter. This is actually the drier of the barrel, so this one's a little bit sweeter than that. Uh, only simply because the, uh, the wine that soaked into the barrels was semi-sweet. These ones, these ones are completely dry. So this one has no sugar whatsoever. People think that rums have to be sweet. Uh, in fact, when they're distilled, they're completely dry. It's just that the rum producers will add the sugar back in at the end of the process, uh, which we do not do. Right. So this one's going to be completely dry, but the character of these barrels is very sherry barrels. So cherry barrels kind of have this, uh, you can almost think of it like this uh, walnut, caramelish kind of like syrup or something, right? Especially aromatically. But on the palate, it's going to be sauce and all that sort of thing. So let's, uh, let's try it so I don't flood you with too much info first. Were those barrels uh, used with, um, yeah. multiple times with cherry before you, before you got them? We we used yeah when these used multiple yeah for actually 21 years no, that, yeah they 20, were 21 20. years in a Solaris system before okay. they came to us yeah these ones were anywhere from five to 12 years okay for aging wine yeah they look pretty new yeah compared to whatever and then you look at those ones and they look yeah. like they've seen quite a bit uh -huh. you know I mean so you don't almost expect your rum to have more character exactly. when it comes out when it comes out of those and these these are the ones this actually makes up when we make the final blend we blend the two together. Uh, oh, oh, between yeah, between the two of them. This one ends up making about 58% of the blend. Okay. Um, and people say, well, you get a whole lot more of these barrels. These actually end up making, we actually have five of these, that one over there too. Um, these end up making a larger portion of the blend mm -hmm. because these are about two and a half times the size of these ones over here. Uh, okay. Right? Even though it doesn't quite look like this. And on top of that, we fill these ones to the brim, these ones we fill to about here. So we end up actually having more of this liquid than the other because we lean on it a little bit more. Okay. Why, why, why don't you fill these up completely? It was just a production, uh, a production piece for us. We would want to, but uh, when we produce the the round of the round, uh -huh. uh, we focused first on making sure that these ones went because I kind of lean towards these a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then we built with the rest of you know, trying to do it evenly on these ones here. So, what do we think on this one? I personally like the one before. The one before. Yeah. Definitely, definitely more mature. It's a little more peppery. Yeah. This one or the other one? This one. Yeah, this one's for sure. This one, you get a little bit more of that old character. This one's kind of superseded by, I think, the poor wine that it used to you know, set it to work. So, softens it, rounds it, uh, but this one has some age to do, so uh, you can definitely tell it's brighter, you know? This one's rounded, softer, you know, less harsh edges. This one still is so bright that it kind of stings at you a little bit, you know? And I think that's because of the age of it still. But eight months from now, I think you'll find that the palate of this one is going to be really good and rounded. Uh, and then this one will soften up the very entry. This one takes up most of the palate, especially the medium and light notes. This one really is the entry. So as it, when you first take the first sip, this one's going to inform a lot of that, uh, especially the high notes in the, uh, in the aroma. So, and that's what we use it for. That's what we blend it to. Because this is a very interesting, great quality rum for the, uh, for the palate. But it needs this one also to soften up the, the very entry. Especially at the strength that we bottle it up at. And people often say, why do you bottle it at such a, you know, such a high strength for most of the yeah. you know, it's, it's tough to, tougher to drink for some people. At the same time, it, you know, it's not as economically feasible because you're using more of the rum. Um, the answer to that is because we have designed it as a sipping rum. And so a lot of people in Puerto Rico won't sip something that's warm. Uh, so they want to put an ice cube in it. But if you put an ice cube in it, something that's 35, 40% alcohol, it'll, it'll taste watered down. It'll taste you know, flat, I suppose. Strong. Yeah, but when it's a little bit stronger, it'll retain the character and the integrity of its flavor, uh, while you know, also cooling it down a little bit. And that's just the, you know the nature of, of how people treat the spirit here. So, anyways, we're in this really warm room. This is the hottest room in the building. So let's go over that way. It doesn't look like that much, but this actually ends up doing about 1,500 bottles a day. But that means you know, once we blend one of these, my job is to really focus in on that 1,500 bottles because it's going to be the next four months of our of our business, um, so we really zone in. Something nice about being this size, right? From there, it's an automatic, you know, direct transit to the bottling mechanism. It automatically fills to, and this is in four bottles at a time, and it's only about, you know, 20, 30 seconds, you know? And we'll hand cork and hand label each and every one of them. So as you come over here, I used to actually have this, this large circle bruise. You can kind of see the outline of it, you know? Um, but I was from hand corking each and every one of these bottles. And so somebody told me, hey, why don't you just use a mallet? And I was like, hey, blow it. There are geniuses among us. So you'll notice that the, the bottles, they don't have their labels on them yet. Right? Because um, this is actually how the, how it looks. Uh, so this is for Richard. One of the things that we did uh, during COVID, you see that that's a batch one. 
we're yeah. prepping now. Once this, this container is done, we're going to move on to batch three. That's the turn point. So we're getting prepared for batch three in about the coming four, four to six months, right? Um, but the batch one, we started during COVID, right? And so some people were like, hey, I really want one of the batch one models, but I can't come to Puerto Rico. And we don't ship outside of Puerto Rico because we don't have a physical nexus in the States, and that's what's required to, to distribute properly. And we don't send them to the mail, things like that. You know, so maybe. So, so what um, we would do is we would write up the name of the person so we can find it, and this whole shelf used to be full of them. Oh, um, when they come, then they just And when they come to Puerto Rico, Rico. and so oh, wow. they that's did. Great. This is kind of the only section that still remains. So I imagine Richard's going to come one day, uh, Ariel is going to come and pick up this bottle one day. Um, but as of now, we'll hold on to them forever if they want, because they're the first buyers of the, of wow. the round, so our first supporters. So they're all sold, huh? They're all sold. All of the batch one is sold. Actually, we have some batch one in a special barrel in the back there. Um, and that's for a special occasion. Oh, man, it's pretty sorted. Um, but this kind of created a tradition for us. That's why we don't label the bottles yet. It's because we figured all of the bottles are coming through here. So that means they're passing through either myself or my business partner's hands. Which means we have a unique opportunity right now to hand write the bottles out, you know, as if it was a personal gift to everybody that buys the bottle. Wow. So we do that same thing now with every one of them. But we're Fernandez, we try to write out the bottle to whoever buys you know, one of them, as long as we're in this space. Hopefully we're not here forever. You know, hopefully we expand a little bit, but I think it's a unique thing to be able to write out the bottles by hand. Yeah, there's something nice about being small, boutique operation. Exactly, exactly. So okay, hopefully we do line. grow, and hopefully you know, it comes to a point where we're not writing every bottle by hand, but, uh, but for now I think it's, a, it's, it's something that we take a lot of pride in. You know? So we'll see as, as time goes on. Can you tell us where you got the name Scryer, which is not Puerto Rican? It's certainly not Puerto Rican. Um, from all accounts, it's, a, it's an Irish Gaelic word, meaning somebody that can see the future. Right? And the reason we called it Scryer is because, you know, when people think about rum, myself included back then in the day, uh, we thought about it and we were like, oh, it's a pina colada kind of thing. It's like a pina colada mixer, that's all. Or people think about their hangovers that they have in Captain Morgan or whatever it might be. Um, my eyes were open, and I hope that the rest of the world will start seeing that rum has the same level of character, the same level of quality as whiskeys and cognacs, you know, that thing, people think that are only exclusive to those two. Uh, rum is the last category to premiumize. Uh, you know, you think about gins even. Gins and tequilas have gone through the roof, even as cow now. It's gone through the roof in my premium options, but rum still sits at this $8 price point, $10 price point. Um, so we're trying to create a rum that's worth sipping and worth spending the money for. Well, it's been several months since we took our Scryer rum tour, and uh, we did initially uh, cut an outro for it, but um, we thought and thought and thought about what, what we said about the tour and whether we were actually being honest with our uh, with the people who watch this video. So we... Uh, yeah, because the more we thought about that tour and processed it, the more we realized we were disappointed in a lot of things about the tour. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, one, you know, it was... Uh, you know, I signed up for the tour. I never got the uh, notification or acknowledgement that uh, you know that the tour was going to be run. Um, you know, the tour was uh, very short. I mean, you know, it ended abruptly. He uh, took us up to see his rooftop, and then next second you, you turned around and he was gone. So we didn't even really realize that it uh, it ended. It sort of started kind of abruptly too, really. And yeah. he didn't really. There was no preamble or anything. He just sort of started talking, and eventually. He got his name out of him. He didn't even introduce himself. Yeah, exactly. And then the music was so loud, I could hardly hear what he was saying. Yeah. And which I'm sure you noticed in the video. Sorry about that. <laughs> but by ending so abruptly, he didn't give us any information with which scryer could make some money, like how to buy a bottle and how much the bottles are, or I don't know any other swag we might want to buy, or to have a drink in the bar or anything. He just sort of dumped us up. Yeah, exactly. Lost opportunities. So, uh, you know, it was, it, was, it was interesting. There's certainly a small, small brewer that do things differently than, uh, you know, than a Bacardi or a Barilito. Uh, you know, so if, in that aspect, it's, it's worth it to come visit. But, uh, yeah, and, and it's good. It's, it's good rum. Good, uh, definitely good it's rum. It's good rum. And good hopefully rum. they'll start to figure out how to do a better job with their tours to get people more excited about their rum and, uh, and buy more stuff so they'll stay open. Yeah, but not our, not our best tour. Not the best tour. But anyhow. But anyway, I hope your suitcase will remain messy. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to be notified of all of our future tours, including Captain Morgan Rum Tour. In uh, St. Croix, in the West Virgin Islands. Hasta luego.